to MindWell, hosted by Michelle Jones. We are all about connecting with wellness professionals and individuals with unique perspectives about developing wholeness and well-being. This podcast is designed to help you reconnect to your core self and find the resiliency, capability, and strength you already have within. MindWell is sponsored by IntegrateTrauma.com. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Mind Well. On this podcast, we interview people who have remarkable perspectives on the power of making mindful connections. I'm your host, Michelle Jones, and I have been looking forward to this episode for a couple of weeks ever since all the details came together that we were going to be having this conversation today. And before I introduce our guest today, I just want to share a little bit about my personal experience with being on two sides of the same coin, because part of what we're going to talk about today is just this experience, this moment in time when two people experience the same event and how each perspective, how we can learn so much from each perspective and be able to develop compassion. And I think as we begin to learn to see that there is context for all of the experiences that we have. So um, in previous episodes, I have shared that I have um, taken a journey through my own personal trauma and have had to find that pathway to wholeness. And through that experience, I had to work through what it is like to be on one side of a coin, which is to be in a position where I had no power and where I was just subject to the actions of somebody else and having to kind of wrestle with all of the things that are connected to that. And then interestingly, because I spent a lot of time with my trauma unresolved as a mother, I would have times when I would be triggered and when I would react in a way that was probably really confusing to my kids. And so therefore, I was in a position to be on the other side of that coin and to know that there were times when my kids were totally powerless to understand what they were experiencing. Now, this situation is completely different, but I've thought about how valuable it has been for me, not only as a trauma practitioner, but just as a human to realize that just when we think we know everything about some, about an event, about an experience, about even a type of trauma, we realize we really only know part of the story un- until we know both sides of that same coin, because there is something of value and something to be learned from both sides of that coin. So I'm excited that we have back with us Mandy Educatus, and she is here with Monty Hawk. And those of you who are able to be here with us in our last episode will remember Mandy because of the dynamic storytelling that she was able to share with us and the powerful thoughts and feelings for, for hope. Um, and so we are going to jump in and kind of reconnect with that day in a new and different way. So just to refresh, because we probably have some listeners here today who were not with us at our last episode. So Mandy, would you be willing to just give us a little summary of the day that you lost Lauren, just to give us a little overview of that day? And then we'll hear from Monty and how he's connected to this event. Of course. First of all, I just want to say hello, Monty, and thank you so much. This means so much to me to have you here, and I just love you. So I'm I'm trying to keep my emotions in check today because we haven't seen each other in a long time, right? Mm-hmm. So anyway, I just want you to know how much I appreciate you being here and doing this for me or for us. So, okay, a, a refresh on that day. So I had taken my kids swimming and that night I was planning on going out on a date with my husband, Lee, and uh, Lee was at work and I was getting ready for our night out and we were waiting for the babysitter and when my daughter Kylie came in to tell me that Lauren had been hit and I had run outside And I had looked everywhere for her and saw her on the street. And 
I was so worried that I I couldn't pick her up. I couldn't hold her because of the way she looked. And, you know, as far as she she was covered in blood and her eye was on her cheek. And so my memories are very fragmented at that at that point. And it wasn't until Monty was able to give me some clarity on his perspective that everything kind of came together. So is that enough in a nutshell or should I? I think that's a perfect place to start. Monty, tell me from your perspective about this day. And you can start like much before you were on that street. Just like tell us on an overview about how that day was from your perspective. And then we'll kind of connect the two of you and see how your perspectives kind of informed one another. So that morning started out with me arriving at the office at about 9 a.m. And that day I was working in the, the office taking calls and working on insurance payments and whatnot. And uh, then we had a CPR first aid course scheduled at 10 a.m. So we got taught CPR and, and first aid, and that was the first time that I had ever taken CPR and I thought wow this is this is pretty cool went on went to lunch came back did some more work in the office and then that evening we were I was uh, co-facilitating a group with one of the owners not many people showed up that which was very unusual. Uh, usually we had 20, 25 people, and this time only three people showed up. Oh, wow. Hmm. So we cut the group short. It normally a three hour group, and we cut it down to, let's see, it was about an hour. Then I said, well, if there's nothing more here, then I'm going to go to a NA 12-step meeting. My boss said, okay. And one of my clients uh, wanted to go, so he jumped on the back of my bike and, and uh, we proceeded. However, normally I would go down a totally different route. But for some reason, I chose to go down 9th East, the street that Mandy and Lauren and Kylie and the whole family lived on. It and, sounds like uh, nothing about this day is as it usually would have been so far. Yeah. Very accurate. Yeah. All the way till the end of the day. So I'm driving down this street where the Adicatuses live was close to the end of that street. It comes to a T. And there's two parks over on the west side of the road. At the first park, and I'm, I don't know, 150 yards away, maybe, 100 yards away, and I see these two little girls coming towards the street, going back to the park, coming towards the street, and I didn't know what they were going to do, so I went ahead and I started slowing down. Um, speed limit on that road is 35. I slowed down just above 30. And when I finally got about 100 feet away, the girls had turned around and started walking back towards the road. 
So I slowed down some more. And at the last moment, Kylie had Lauren's hand and Kylie started running across the street and I didn't have anywhere to go. So I ended up hitting Lolly, Lauren. I stopped my bike, I got off, I went back. There was no pulse, she wasn't breathing. And you had just learned how to check for those things just that morning. Yep. Wow. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. Yeah. That definitely was not coincidence. No. I don't believe in coincidence. I don't either. I believe our creator or God or whoever has everything planned out. So... As I'm doing chest compressions, after I tried to get my mouth to fit over her nose and her mouth to give her some air, I went to chest compressions on the third one. I got this shock that ran up my arm. I didn't know what it was, but... um, On the fourth compression, she started breathing. And then Mandy came up behind me and grabbed me by the collar of my shirt and said, get away from my daughter. I did so after some a short period of time, paramedics, ambulances, police all showed up. Yeah, um, I come from a a background of, I started using drugs and alcohol when I was 10 years old. Oh, wow. That's so young. And I stopped when I was 33. And so I come from the streets. And at that point, when Mandy grabbed me and I walked away, I thought for sure that I was going to prison for for murder. But the police came. They said that Mandy was not going to press charges. And all the other witnesses had said that, no, it was an accident. There wasn't anything he could do different. Despite all the time that you had spent in these probably pretty rough circumstances in your younger life. I'm sure that nothing can prepare you for a moment like this. Absolutely nothing. For two weeks after the accident, uh, I didn't sleep. Every time I closed my eyes, I could see Lolly's face. And it wasn't a happy picture. Yeah, and that's that's something that takes a very long time. I'm sure it was the same way for you until you could look at or remember her the way, well, at least from the pictures that you had seen. And I know that I, w- I felt that same way. I had to carry a picture of her with me so that I could see her or remember her that way because the first thought or impression that you have for a long time is that gruesome picture of her on the road. I get Yes. And I I asked you for a a picture because of her smiling because I just, I had to have something different. That's right. I remember that. I remember that. So, so... For that two-week period of time, you obviously were struggling. You couldn't sleep. You kept having these visuals popped in your head. And then did something shift at that point for you? A friend of mine um, invited me rather strong suggestion that I (laughs) go for a ride with him out to Wisconsin. 
And so I took a ride. I still didn't sleep well. It was a, a celebration. And when at our when we arrived, they were having a good time. The music was going, and this is a, a recovery motorcycle group. So I I wasn't in danger of or drinking. It really wasn't until about ten years later that I was able to really let go. So many times I feel like in these kind of situations, um, as a friend or an associate or just an acquaintance even, there's so many times when we think, I don't know what to say. I want to reach out. I don't know how to connect. I don't know how to offer support or encouragement in this situation. And I'm interested to hear from each one of you in in these days that immediately followed, like, for example, this friend that strongly encouraged you to take a ride to Wisconsin. Are you glad that that friend reached out to you, even though I'm sure it was a little awkward at the time? Yes, 100%. And, you know, um, kind of awkwardly, but for me, Mandy called me after they unplugged Lauren and asked me if I would come to the view. Were you surprised to hear from her? Uh-huh. I very much so. Uh, I, I just didn't, I didn't know how to respond. But I knew, or at least I was thinking in my head that, well, maybe they've done some good work on her and it'll be a better picture for my head. Uh, and uh, it wasn't. They tried to do their best, but... Uh, it was still not the relief that you were looking for. So, right. So talking about this kind of connecting to one another, because this is really the start of this bridge for the two of you then. Yes. so. Mandy, tell us a little bit about, I mean, my, I mean, I can only imagine what I would do. I think the thing that I've learned the most about connecting to people with trauma is that what we think we might do in a moment and what we are actually, um, how we actually respond and how our body responds and the things that we feel directed to do in that moment, mm -hmm. um, that we can't really know that until we're there in that space. And that's why it's so important not to judge other people, because until we've been in that space, we don't know exactly what we would do. So share with us some insight into what made you reach out to Monty? I think it was the day after we had turned off the machines and I was at home and I, I thought, you know, I was feeling desperate and sad, obviously, you know, didn't know what to do with myself. And so I had the thought, I just, the only person that truly understands me for me was God. And so I remember getting on my knees and praying. And I remember getting the impression Pray to see Monty the way I do. Wow. And so that's what I did. I asked, I asked that I would be able to see and know Monty through God's eyes. And by the end of the prayer, I had this feeling of love for Monty that I absolutely cannot explain, even to this day. Sorry. I just, I just felt, I felt him, his spirit, who he was and what an amazing man he was. And I, I also got the impression that this happened to him, just like us, for a reason. And as you said there, I don't, you know, don't believe in coincidences because I think about how your life changed from that. And mine also, which I'm sure we'll talk about later, but I still to this day, I still, when I talk about you, when I 
see you. This is the first time I've seen you in, in many years, but I just, I have a genuine love for you. I really do. So th- that's, it was more just an impression that I, that I got to, to pray and, and that's, this was the result basically. And did feeling that change in perspective and that love, did, did that at all change how your grief felt? I'm just curious if it changed sort of any of the thoughts or perspectives that you were having at that time, because as a, as a mother, I'm imagining, right. Cause that's all I can do is put myself in that situation in my own imagination. And even if it's an accident, I could find myself, I would think um, being really focused on what could have been, what should have been, what, what should have changed. What about this other person? Am I sure it was an accident? I mean, all of these thoughts just stirring in my mind and that could just be my wacky mind, but I'm curious if it changed anything for you having this added perspective to all these swirling thoughts. Yes. I mean, I, I think grief is grief as far as losing a child. It's, it's something that you just never get over. However, it did change my perspective and one of the first things I thought of after I had prayed that day was I became worried about Monty mm-hmm. and worried about if he was okay, if, I mean, I can't imagine being in your position. I mean, I, I think about that often as I'm just driving down the street and there's kids running around and I think, what would it feel like to be in your shoes? And my heart hurts for you because I can't imagine. So if you're asking if it made the, my healing journey a little easier, I believe so. I believe that for me, being able to let go and forgive, even if there was nothing to forgive because it wasn't your fault, it just it helped me be able to kind of see things from a different perspective and worry about, you know, obviously I was worried about myself and my family, but also for Monty's well-being also. So, so Monty, what did it mean to you when Mandy reached out to you and extended this invitation for you to come and be part of this, this viewing? And I'm not sure if you also attended the funeral. So at first, like I said earlier, it was a bit awkward, but I, I too discovered a deep caring and love for Mandy, for Lauren, for all the girls, for, and I, to be honest with you, at that time I was scared of Lee because <laughs> I, I, I didn't know what to expect, you know? Sure. I'd never experienced anything like this. It tore my heart out. I can only imagine. Yeah. I've yeah. actually kind of like Mandy has said, I've often had that thought. And I and I often think, you know, there's this phrase that I've heard since I was a little girl, like, but for the grace of God, go I. And I have thought that myself about both of the situations that the two of you are in, that Anytime we think that we're above or separate from being in any of these circumstances, that we really don't have any power to control that. And I think about that often as a driver, even though I've been fortunate enough not to be in any accidents where someone was seriously hurt. But I know, but for a moment, that that could be me. And to think about the weight of that, um, it would seem to me that it would be almost intolerable to bear. It was. Mandy mentioned that for both of you, that each of your lives, maybe in this day, I kind of think of the word pivot, that maybe things took a different path or a different trajectory from this point forward for each of you. Um, If you felt like that is true for you, how would you say that it changed things for you? Honestly, it, it, gave me an opportunity to look at my career and really proceed with um, becoming a therapist. Oh, wow. Which I did accomplish. 
and um, I've been in the field now for 20, 20 plus years. Wow. And it would seem to me that that would be pretty meaningful work. Do you feel like in some way this directed you to a work that you can be more passionate about or something that feels more meaningful to you than the work that you were doing before? Yeah, I'm not a pencil pusher. <laughs> I, I don't do well sitting behind the desk. If I'm talking to somebody, I want them to be in front of me. Mm. Mm-hmm. I don't want a desk in between us. I want to be able to feel their energy and and get a good understanding of really what's going on. There was something that Mandy had told me. I don't remember when, but she told me about Lauren's dream. Yeah. And to me, she she's was an impact. I think it was some time, but I after a lot of prayer, my creator told me that that shock that went up my arm when I was giving her compressions was Lauren's soul. That gift, I look at it as a gift. Um, She gave me the ability to see people in a different light, if you will. Absolutely. I I feel like there's so much um, honor in being able to be there at the transition of people from from life to death. I think that there's so, um, it's like everything is still for a moment and we are Mm -hmm. able to truly sense something greater than ourselves in those moments. And I think that it's really beautiful that you were able to, even in the shock and the chaos of that moment, be tuned in to that change that was taking place. Mandy, I'm curious for you, um, has it made a difference for you? Um, because I know at the time, and partly because you've shared this with me before, so I'm going to bring in some information that 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 you shared with me before, that because of what a shock your body was in and your mind at the time of the accident, that for you, the memories of that day were pretty fragmented, that there were pieces of it that didn't all connect with each other and it was hard for you to remember. What Mm -hmm. did it mean for you to be able to have Monty's perspective to help sort of fill in the gaps of that day? Well, it, it, it was huge for me. Excuse me. Um, so because my memories were, you know, standing in the street and seeing somebody else picking up Lauren and holding her on the sidewalk, that was my memory for so many years. Until you had said, Monty, you were sitting on the sidewalk holding Lauren. And I was like, no, no, that wasn't me. And so to be able to hear that, from you was huge for me because even though when I sat and interviewed you for the book you told me but my brain still wasn't ready to process that so you told me and it went in one ear and out the other and I probably said oh wow that's that's interesting but then shut it out again immediately hearing your side of the story and being able to connect those dots was so helpful to me because in that moment of shock everything stood still and you know it wasn't until several years many years later that I was able to um, remember certain things after you know as I was going through my own trauma work and then I was able to connect yours your dots with my story and with my trauma and 
that is where I feel like my healing truly took place. And tell us a little bit about why that specific piece of information was so important to you, because you had remembered something different about you and being able to physically hold and comfort Lauren on that day. So give us a little bit more insight why that specific information was actually like a beautiful gift for you. Well, I think it's because I had spent all of this time thinking what a terrible mother I was that I wasn't able to hold my own daughter. I mean, you think about, if you really think about your child being hit or any situation, your first instinct is to scoop them up and hold them, love them, do whatever it takes to be able to um, to help them. And because I had gone so many years thinking I was a failure as a mother and, you know, my other kids probably would be better off with another mom, someone that, that truly, you know, was able to to be there for them because if I wasn't able to be there for Lauren, how, how was I going to be there for, you know, for my other kids? And it was just, it was torture for a, a long time. Wow. So I'm curious to hear, there's so much that could be said here, but something is going to come to mind, I think, for each one of you. What do you understand now because of this experience both of you from that event that day what do you understand now that you didn't before this event in your life whichever one of you wants to go first what we understand in general or yeah it could be whatever comes to mind because I think that sometimes we go along in life and we really think we know we know how everything works. We right. know how the world works. We know, you know, that people who do these things are, are, you know, defined in this way. We think we know things about how the world works. And then we experience one of these moments mm. where literally the world stops for a moment. And from that point, when it starts spinning again and we go, we understand and we know things just a little bit differently than right. we did before that moment. So I'm curious for each one of you, what is what is just even a piece of that that you could share with us today? Do you want to go, you want to go first? <laughs> um, I think one of the biggest things is I've learned not to judge other people. Wow. And not just in grieving, but in life in general, because we don't know what others have gone through that has that has caused them to act react in a certain way and i think it's it's been a blessing for me to kind of just be able to see people the way hopefully the way that um the lord would see them not being able to judge is huge because we just don't know someone's story so that was probably one of the biggest things that I had learned to, um, one lesson that I had learned from all of this. Absolutely. You know, it's interesting because I think, and I'm sure that there's exceptions. I'm sure there's just these, you know, really self-actualized people. But it seems to me that those who learn to see others without judgment, to see people for who they really are, not for just who we think they are, mm -hmm. that those people have usually been through experiences that have opened them up in some way to be able to realize that, oh, no, we can't see just by looking at others what the whole story is here, because I have my story, too, that that others don't know because I have found that for my own experience that that has absolutely been the case. And it's not even something that I have to work very hard at to not be judgmental. It just never occurs to me to take things at face value because I just instinctively know that there's more that I don't know to the story of what's before me. So thank you for sharing that, Mandy. Yes, of course. <clears throat> so for me, as time went on it was a really pivotal time in my life where 
um, because in the beginning, I was cussing God. Mm. Why would you let me do something like this? Absolutely. Mm. You know, I, I'll never be forgiven. I'll never be able to forgive myself. <clears throat> and uh, I really had to, I started seeing a therapist. And after some time, like nine months, um, I gained a better understanding of creator, of my higher power. I really had to listen to what I had told myself so many years before was that creator is all loving, all forgiving, and all caring. Definitely. I didn't I didn't see that in him. At the until, beginning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because here we are one more time. You know, uh I'm in a spot where uh, actually, this was the worst spot I'd ever been in, but where he let me down. I remember so many nights after that, just praying, why won't you let her live? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. So um, there was a point that... Um, Lauren came to you, is that correct? Yes. Could you talk about that? Is that, is that something you're yeah. okay with sharing? I practice um, not only 12-step recovery, but I practice Native American spirituality. And one year I was um, at a Sundance which is a very spiritual and the sun dancers are praying for the people. I was standing looking at this tree and there was Lolly. I say Lolly because she was five years old. Right. But as I continued to dance, She became a young woman. She said, everything is good. I love you, Mindy. Wow. And I, I didn't know what to say. I didn't know. I just knew that I needed to keep praying. So That's I did. Beautiful. And eventually sister showed up Kylie and then Kylie took her off took her away oh. that was pretty powerful for me because I was stuck way back when she was five years old mm, yeah. and that was the picture I had in my head and even though they were smiley pictures, the ones that <laughs> Mandy sent me, but to be able to see her, what, at that time she was probably 15 to 18 when that happened. And uh, I got to see Lauren growing up. So, you know... And this is what's interesting about this. And I don't remember hearing that part of the story, but what's interesting is when Lauren had been transported to primary children's in Salt Lake, um, Lee had gone to get a different car and it was about 10 o'clock at night and we were going to drive up to pr uh, primary children's. And I was alone in the house, which was probably a bad idea, but I remember... Wow. Being uh, going down the hallway with like random clothes to take to the hospital and clothes that didn't even like make sense, 
But I just remember collapsing on the floor and sobbing and almost screaming, saying, I can't do this. And then I saw Lauren. Lauren came and she was standing in the hallway and she was about 18 years old. And she had long, long, straight blonde hair. And she had a big smile on her face and she was wearing a white dress. I was looking at her thinking, why, why am I seeing you as an 18 or 20 year old? This isn't familiar to me. I, I don't, I don't remember you this way. This isn't giving me comfort. So that's interesting for me to hear that you saw her also as that same age. So I really yeah. appreciate you telling me that. I did oh. know. Oh, wow. Monty, you said something really interesting as part of this kind of spiritual journey that you had with kind of your higher power. And that part of that was like, how am I going to forgive myself? And that is really like the next segment that I want to lead us into, because I think that that's one of the things that's the hardest for an outsider to this situation to look in at this situation and to really comprehend what does forgiveness even mean in this situation? And what does it involve? And as I really thought about that, and, you know, maybe dialing back to my own experience of being on two sides of the same coin. I both know what it is to feel like, is there someone else that I need to feel forgiveness for? But it was interesting because for me, the harder one was how do I forgive myself? So I'm interested to hear because as so I just was kind of pondering some of these things and here were some of the things and you guys can share or say, no, you got that messed up, Michelle. Like it's actually like this. But I was thinking, for Mandy, that some of the things that may have come up for you were around forgiveness would be like your neighbor to forgive yourself for not being there in that moment, maybe God, maybe Monty. And then for Monty, maybe to forgive yourself, but maybe even how do you forgive God for putting you in this situation? So I'm curious Mm -hmm. to hear what have been your experiences around forgiveness or what do you understand about forgiveness now having been through this experience that maybe an outsider may not understand because they haven't wrestled with this? I think that I had, I had previously gone through some very extremely hard situations in my life that I felt I had to learn to forgive certain people um, because if I didn't, it's it kind of just eats away at who you are. And with Monty, it wasn't, I don't think I was ever, um, I don't feel like I, I needed to forgive him. It just never, it just, it just didn't occur to me because I don't know, I, I, didn't feel like it was necessary because I knew that he was hurting. I knew that he was in pain also and going through his um, his heartache and, and I'm sure, you know, trying to forgive himself. Um, and I know that a lot of people are angry at God. I mean, I, I'm in a, uh, I help out with a support group for parents that have lost a child and that's one of the number one things that I hear. I'm angry. I'm angry at God. You know, and I feel like it's normal to feel like we want to sh- to kind of have somebody take that blame. You know, whether it's God or whether we feel like we are choosing God to be angry at for what we've gone through. And I think it's just a normal. It's very normal for a lot of people, but for me. Learning to forgive in general helps has helped me let go of all of those things that don't serve me for good. Right? That the, the pain, the anguish, the hate, the bitterness. When life is so much more than that, it's so much more than that. You know, whether it's a family member that we're angry at, or it doesn't matter what the situation is. Holding on to anger and not forgiving, it's it's more hurtful for us or to us than to anyone else, is how I see that. That's really quite remarkable, actually. And I feel like 
you say for many people, that would be a normal response. I would even venture to say that you having this experience, I think a lot of times people who have been through unimaginable trauma often have something. There's something, it's call it a gift, call it whatever it is. There's some quality, some attribute, some perspective. Um, For me, part of it was that I retained my capacity to love, for example, through all of my experiences. And I, and I wonder if this ability to just not feel that anger and to not feel the need to have to, to have it be somebody's fault or to have there be mm-hmm. a blame mm-hmm. and therefore to have forgiveness be such a fluid part of this experience if that was part of your gift, because I feel like that's a really unusual experience. Lee also felt that same way. Wow. Like he, and I remember, I don't know if you remember this, Monty, but at the funeral when all of you guys came and you came with, there was a ton of motorcycles that all showed up at the same time. And there was a lot of people outside and we were waiting to go in for the funeral. And you got off your bike and you started with your with your friends and started heading towards us. And everyone outside, it went silent because I don't think anyone knew what was going to happen, like mm. what the reaction was going to be. It was just kind of one of those moments. It was very surreal, I think. But, you know, I think Lee was one of the first to go up and hug you because he was he felt the same way I did like Monty's a great guy this is just something that was unfortunate that happened that you know he he did neither one of us wanted you to feel awkward at all because we knew that everyone around that was staring you know I think not that they were judging you necessarily I don't know but I think that it was more of what's going to happen What's the, you know, the dynamics, like what, what do we expect? But I think that once they saw that we were okay, everyone kind of relaxed and they were like, oh, okay. So I don't know if that made a difference to other people seeing that, you know, others can get along. There can be peace that can come about from something very difficult and very sad. Very tragic. Very tragic. You know, it's interesting because I was talking with a friend before the recording today. And I said, you know, there's, you know, all of these circumstances come up in our lives. And so often we feel like, I don't know what to say. Like, I want to bridge the gap. I don't want this to be something that divides us. And yet I don't want to say the wrong thing. I don't want to, you know, make it more painful for them or to put my foot in my mouth, essentially. And I think one thing that I am gaining more and more confidence in as we are talking today is that it doesn't really matter what the bridge looks like that we extend between us and other people, just put the bridge down and we'll sort out the awkwardness later. Monty, I would love to hear some of your thoughts about forgiveness. You know, I, I really, I really didn't forgive God and I didn't forgive myself until that day I saw Lauren. Wow. That was probably, oh, well, I know it was more than anything I could have ever expected or hoped for. Mm. Um, but I believe that Creator knew that I wasn't going to do anything until I had something solid to look at and go. Okay. When that happened, I went to the spirit world for a little while after I after she left, and uh, wow, that's when I was able to really talk to Creator and say I'm sorry, truly, because I I. I grew up saying I'm sorry. So that that's kind of like, you know, it doesn't mean anything anymore. Right. So by my actions, I feel I can send a better message than by my mouth. And uh, 
For sure. Wow. You know, I was just thinking as I was listening to the two of you and also pondering some of my own experiences with forgiveness, because, it, you know, for me, it, I did not have the experience that Mandy had. For me, it was a wrestle. It was something that I have had to really struggle and wrestle with and sort of argue my own best arguments against myself in many cases, right? And one of the things that seems to be this common thread, though, is that forgiveness is really less about another person or less about how God is responding or whatever the circumstance is, but it seems like it's more of a shift in our perspective. It's like our ability to to like shift what we're focused on, um, how we're interpreting what's happening, and to be able to shift our perspective from one that's focused on pain and suffering to be able to focus on something else that is light and hope and sort of is able to recognize the path through. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that seems like a really powerful sort of transition and that what we label as forgiveness can is actually just this really is also part of this really powerful transition to being able to see ourselves and the world from an inherent place of hope rather than one of inherent pain. Absolutely. I agree. So before we wrap up Monty, I'm really excited and interested to hear about the work that you do with drug and alcohol recovery. Will you share with us some of the work that you've done in your life for those that are recovering from dependency on drugs or alcohol? To start off, I don't just do addiction and alcoholism. I also deal with mental health issues. Mm. Mm. Um, And so as long as I've been in this business, and I I, I really don't like saying it's a business, but that's in reality, that's what it is. I have been able to, to be here for people who struggle. You know, when I first started to go to school for this, I told myself, irregardless, if I can touch one person, creator, that's all I need. Apparently, he has other things in store for me (laughs) because I'm still here. So, yeah, it's it's been, it it seems like, for me, it's, it's fairly easy. Because I lived that life, I even lived a life with mental health issues. Mm -hmm. So to be able to help somebody else has been a major gift. And like I said, I believe Lauren was the one that started me on this, on this journey. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So, So, Monty, what would you say to bring hope to someone who may be struggling with either some mental health issues or with drug and alcohol? What would you say to bring them hope? Is there hope for people? There's always hope. Every moment of every day that you're breathing, there's hope. Mm. When, and then, you know, this is the hardest thing for people with mental health or it's it's a co-occurring disorder most of the time Mm -hmm. to pick up a phone and call somebody that phone is about 10,000 pounds it's so brave Mm -hmm. it's so brave I think yeah that's not and for them to just take that moment and call call a, a hotline, call a treatment facility, whatever it takes. Just take that moment and get that ball going. And that's the action part. Creator is going to take care of the rest. Exactly. I love that. 
That is that is beautiful. And I think you've touched on something that is one of my very favorite things to recognize about people who dare to have some hope and to lean in and to lean forward to push through the mess that we all find ourselves in at various points in our life and to like reach for hope. It is the bravest thing. Mm -hmm. People that I, you know, in the work that I do as I work with people who have been through trauma, I just think I have the privilege to like interact with and to sit across from some of the bravest people I will ever meet in my life who are willing to do that. And I just admire it so much. Before we close, I'm really interested to know, is there anything else that you would like to say or to share about this experience that has brought the two of you together that you haven't yet had a chance to share? We've stayed in contact, I think, over the years. And I, you know, I I had the opportunity to meet with Monty several years ago and be able to sit down and record his story. And I think just, you know, for me, writing a book um, has helped me almost kind of get to know Monty in a deeper way, even though it's only from his side of the story. So that's, that's been a gift for me. It has. And I think um, for me now, next month, I'll have 30 years in recovery for me now recognizing the impact that the educators family has had on me it, it it's nothing less than a miracle they have all touched my heart so much kylie just sent me a friend request on facebook she just I told like, me that yes yeah I, I was like holy mackerel Maybe maybe she does have some forgiveness. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely, she does. And I just had a, a quick question, and I know that this is just one thing that is always on, in the back of my mind, and I know that last time I asked you, you said you didn't know, but the man that was on the back of your bike that day, is there any news on where he is or what happened to him? All I heard was... Um, he started using again. Oh. Yeah. That was a pretty traumatic event for him. Most um, definitely. Probably for everyone on the scene that day, I can imagine. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he, he stayed in, in treatment with us. See, I, I took a month off. So he was there probably another three weeks when I got back, he was gone. Mm. And not too long ago, I heard that he was out there using. In my world, you don't really know if that's a a reality. Right. Because most of the people I deal with are in their own reality. (laughs) right sure well thank you so much to both of you to Monty and to Mandy speaking of bravery I just love that I had the privilege to be here and I know it doesn't feel very brave probably because you guys already have this connection and yet I think it was and so I'm thankful that you brought your perspectives and I feel like myself and all of our listeners, that there's a lot that we can learn from both sides of this, of, of this event. And specifically just from the beautiful, like, um, love and hope that I just have felt throughout this entire conversation from both of you. So I just want to say thank you for being here today. And, um, Mandy, I did not hear you mention the name of your book that is coming out. I know that you're still looking for a publisher, but can you share the title of your book with us? Uh, Yeah, it's called Thank You for the Jesus. And that's just what Lauren would say when she would begin her prayers. She would always say thank you for the Jesus before she went on to saying whatever else she was going to pray about. So that's going to be the name of the book. Just trying to find a publisher right now. I love that so much. Okay, well, thank you for joining us on 
Mind Well Today, the podcast that introduces you to exceptional individuals that are developing powerful, mindful connections. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to another episode of Mind Well. We are sponsored by Trauma Integration, LLC, a company passionate about helping people understand their trauma response and find wholeness within. You can find out more at www.integratetrauma.com. Thank you.